Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, the show where we dig deep into the insights of some of the leading policymakers and business people in the Middle East and indeed the world. I'm Frank Kane. Today I'm delighted to be joined from New York by Huma Abedin, for many years a leading advisor to Hillary Clinton, the former US Secretary of State. She has just published a book, Both and, A Life in Many Worlds, about her time growing up in Saudi Arabia and her subsequent journey to the corridors of power in Washington, D.C. Ms. Abedin, welcome to Frankly Speaking. Frank, thank you for having me on your show. I'm looking forward to our conversation. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Uh, your book is a fascinating narrative, I must say, of a life that has had, I think it's fair to say, a share of ups and downs. Uh, but tell me, why did you write it now? With all your experience, you surely have many years in top positions ahead of you. Should we regard this as volume one? Well, the book, as you and I have already discussed uh, when we were speaking previously, the book is long. It actually could have been two volumes uh, as it currently exists. But the reason I chose to write my story, number one, I believe it's a good story. Uh, number two, uh, I think that we live in a time where if you don't write your own story down, somebody else is writing history. I grew up raised by two academics. Um, books were in our house all the time. And so I loved sharing this you know, extraordinarily privileged life that I lived full of opportunities and possibilities and, um, and, and now kind of ready for the next chapter in my life. But this book uh, is, uh, is a real testament to the amazing life I had growing up in Saudi Arabia and traveling the world and working in politics and public service and government for many years. Uh, the book is also a testament, uh, I think, from my reading of it, to the influence of your father, uh, who passed away when you were a teenager. Tell me, why has he been such a big influence on your life? Well, so much. I tell people, you know, sometimes when I'm asked the question of why did you write the book, I, I say really it is a love letter to my father. And uh, he passed away when I was 17, leaving for university. And, uh, and for me, this book is... Uh, if I could have one more conversation with him, just one more time, I would share this book with him and say, this is what I've done with my life. And I hope you're proud of me. And I am a product of immigrant parents, an Indian father, a Pakistani mother. They left their countries in the 60s to pursue education in the United States. They were both Fulbright scholars. My father was a political scientist. My mother a sociologist. And, you know, they, for them, education was a religion. There was nothing more important than pursuing education. In fact, as I share um, so much about my faith uh, in the book, I remind people that the very first word revealed to the prophet Muhammad, who we believe in, was read. And so education really was very important. They came to the United States. I was born in Michigan. And when I was two, uh, my father was diagnosed with renal failure, and he was told by the doctor uh, that he had five to 10 years and to get his affairs in order. And one of the very first lines I wrote in my book was uh, my father was told he was dying. And so he went out and he lived. And two months later, we moved to Saudi Arabia. My father had been given a sabbatical opportunity at a newly opened King Abdulaziz University at the time. And my mother was offered a teaching position too. And that one year sabbatical essentially turned into four decades um, and I think that that life that my parents gave us in Saudi Arabia, you know, one of the reasons we moved there was my parents wanted us to learn about our faith. And they thought learning about history was really important because, you know, he always said our eyes are at the front of our head for a reason um, to look forward, that even though history was important to learn from, that we needed to be focused on the future. And so from a very young age, we traveled the world. We grew up in a very, very international, multicultural environment in Jeddah. I went to an international school and we traveled the world and we were taught to respect other faiths and cultures and languages and places and appreciate them. So when I walked into the White House as a 21 year old intern in 1996, I brought that international perspective grounded from my parents along with me. Uh, the enduring uh, relationship in your career has been with Hillary Clinton, who you advised in various capacities in her rise to high office, but who ultimately failed in 2016 in her attempt to become the first female president of the USA. This, this has led to the divisive presidency of Donald Trump and much of the polarization that's taken place since then. 
Tell me, frankly speaking, how did it all go so wrong in 2016? I think at this point, there has been so much analysis about all the things that contributed to her loss in 2016. I do like to remind people that uh, two things. Number one, many millions more people voted for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. The way our the political system in our country works is it's not the most the person who gets the most votes who necessarily wins the presidency. And that was certainly uh, the case uh, for Hillary Clinton. I would also make the argument that our country was divided uh, before 2016. Certainly there were dark forces and voices and attitudes that were allowed to proliferate. But as I share in the book, you know, when I walked into the White House in 1996, it was not a rosy political environment. Democrats and Republicans had differences on many, many things. And the way forward, the only way forward, the way I was raised in politics and public service was forcing differing opinions to the table, being able to leave the office and go down the street and have dinner together and hash out your differences. And that has changed. I mean, the White House, the Washington I worked in in the 2000s when I worked in the United States Senate and when I was in the White House, even when I worked at the State Department, um, it's not the same Washington. It's not the parties have become so much more uh, divided and in terms of just basic human common decency uh, seems to have been really allowed to just disappear. And I'm, I am very sad about that. 2016, I would argue that my boss uh, actually did quite well. And the external forces, every time, and I write about this in detail in my book, everything from the misogyny, from the attacks, when you have somebody every single day suggesting that you might go to jail without explaining why, as had been the case for her, the attacks she had to endure multiple times a day, those things had an effect. And to have an FBI investigation that had a late breaking uh, role in changing, altering the course of the election in an election that tight, every little thing mattered. And, and that was a big thing. So the forces against uh, our party and, and our candidate really were quite overwhelming uh, in that moment. And, uh, and so I still get up every single day and I think about how our country would have been different today if she had been elected in 2016. And I hope one of the things when you walk away from my book, one of the many reasons I wrote the book, you asked me earlier, Frank, is that you see what an extraordinary leader and president she would have been, what an extraordinary leader she is and president she would have been. You were vice chair of the 2016 campaign, weren't you? So uh, I guess you must feel some uh, responsibility for that defeat. I felt an uh, entire responsibility for that defeat as I write about in, in great detail because there, uh, there is a belief, there are people who believe uh, that the uh, announcement made by the then FBI director 11 days before the election, as it related to my ex-husband's laptop, which revealed emails um, of mine on them, uh, that announcement jolted the, uh, the campaign. And then for two days before the election, for there to be a second announcement saying the investigation had been closed again, absolutely, I did uh, want to take and felt responsible uh, and it took me to a very low, very, very dark uh, personal space that I had to actually get professional help uh, to get out of. And again, it's one of the many reasons I wrote that book. I grew up in a culture, in a, in a, in a time and space, you didn't talk about many things and certainly you didn't go to therapy. And, uh, and it took me a long time. Uh, it took me a long time to get to that place. And, uh, and I'm glad I did. Let me ask you about Hillary land, as you call it in the book, uh, because you have staunchly defended Mrs. Clinton uh, throughout the various crises that she's faced in her political life, the Starr investigation, uh, uh, the email furore, uh, the Benghazi affair and others. Tell me, you know, at, at the crux of it, why has she aroused such polarized reaction in the USA? Because she is a powerful, smart, ambitious woman. And we are in this country, in my opinion, still afraid of powerful women. And she tried to shatter that highest and hardest glass ceiling. And she tried to do it more than once. 
It is one of the reasons I share in detail how hard it was, what it was like seeing that misogyny on the road in 2008, in particular, when she was the only woman running for president and how we didn't know how to deal with it. So we laughed. So whenever there was a comment about her hair or her clothes or her voice was annoying or she's crying or she's not, there was such a fixation um, on, on, you know, frankly, a fixation on both Clintons, two extraordinary leaders, in, in my opinion, uh, for this country. And, uh, and, and yes, as a result, uh, she did have a lot of uh, detractors. And the way she operates in the world, this is just how she's wired. She, for the most part, doesn't pay attention to the nonsense and the noise. So in the 1990s, uh, as you well, I'm sure, remember, Frank, we lived in the world of 24-hour cable news, which was new. So every single day was about telling your proactive message. What was your one message of the day? If it was healthcare, that's all you talked about. You didn't respond to any of the nonsense that was out in the world. That has changed in 2008 and certainly in 2016 and absolutely today. We live in a 24-second news cycle with social media. So all of these stories that we just completely disregarded in 2016, fake news, outright fake news, was, we found out later, fully believed by people. And it's shocking what people, uh, what do they say? A, a, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Uh, it can be very, very damaging. And, and we certainly paid the price. Uh, early in your days in Hillary land, you write about your uh, first impressions of, of entering the splendor, the grandeur of the White House, and you say, quote, uh, American power spoke for itself. Uh, but times have changed, haven't they? And the US is facing multiple challenges on the global stage. Tell me, is America losing its voice in the world? Is its voice still being heard? That's why I write so much in detail about that in the book. This, when I did walk in you know, to remind, um, or actually I shouldn't even say remind for people who have not read the book yet, I was living in Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War, during Operation Desert Storm. And I share how I was watching on TV, uh, sitting in my apartment, our family's apartment in Jeddah, and seeing uh, you know, General Colin Powell and Norman Schwarzkopf and King Fahad uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia at the time, this sort of multilateral effort uh, to uh, expunge then uh, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein's uh, forces out of Kuwait. So to me, what I perceived in that moment was this, this joint effort, um, which was fast and it was successful. And, and so to walk into the White House in 1996, yeah, I absolutely believed America was the sole superpower in the world. But over the years, seeing that that is a complicated relationship, and it has always been a, a complicated relationship. I think we're learning that recently in places like Afghanistan and certainly in Iraq after these long wars, you can't go into countries and tell them how to um, live their lives and and uh, and build their governments, but it's not it's not that simple. I, I I talk about going to South Asia and going to places like Pakistan. I mean, there are countries who ex are dependent on our country um, for resources, certainly financial resources, amongst other things, and at the same time want to have their own sovereign rights to you know, carry out their government and their national affairs as they so choose. It is constantly gonna be a push and pull. I think uh, uh, it is my opinion that uh, our standing in the world certainly uh, took a step back uh, in 2016. And this administration has their hands full trying to build back that relationship, th that rapport. Uh, in some parts of the world and certainly in the Middle East, these relationships that leaders have, there's, there's something very special about it. And, and my boss knew that and, and she did maintain those relationships. And to me, uh, it is a, a very effective way to get things done. And I, I think she was a good model for that. Uh, domestically, Ms. Abdeen, uh, America has in recent years become uh, very divided. Uh, racial, political tensions are at a boiling point. Some ex experts are talking about a imminent breakdown in American democracy. The New Yorker recently speculated about the possibility of civil war. What's your take on this deterioration? One of the reasons I wrote this book is because I wanted to 
share with Americans uh, and with people what it is to be a Muslim American in this country. And it is why I wrote in detail uh, about the accusations that my family faced in 2012 uh, when I was working at the State Department and I was attacked for my, uh, because simply because I was Muslim and I had two Muslim parents and five Republican members of Congress wrote letters to the inspector generals of the State Department amongst other agencies, asked that I be investigated along with other high ranking Muslim Americans. And I just wanna take a step back and remind people this was 2012. And I believe frankly, that that experience that those of us had was really an appetizer for what was to come. This idea that you could create, label somebody the other, um, make them the boogeyman. I, I believe my faith was made a boogeyman in, uh, in that 2016 uh, election. And the only way forward is for people to, you know, people say to me all the time, my father always said, you have to talk to the other. I mean, he would take us, we would be at churches around the world and sitting and talking to faith leaders. He was a very devout Muslim, but he believed the only way forward. People would say, don't go have conversations where even angels fear to tread. And he would, and he did. And it is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to have uncomfortable conversations. And certainly do I see a divide in this country? Absolutely, we all do. And unless, we are willing to step forward to continue to engage in public service. We have a choice in the kind of country uh, we're going to live in. And it is very scary to see um, some of the language uh, that's out there in the world. Very scary. Uh, many see you as a rare American uh, success story in that you are Muslim and you are a woman, uh, which makes you even rarer, I guess. What would your advice be then to uh, persuade uh, young Muslims, men or women, uh, uh, to follow your example, to get involved in the way that you have? Well, you know, I've always liked being the invisible behind the scenes person. I don't like, you know, uh, being out in the world. I, I'm, I liked being private and my, I was forced to be in public. Um, and so what I always say to people is I chose to do the thing that scared me the most by writing this book and coming out in the world and talking about it. And um, I share, uh, which is why I think this is very important. In 2008, when Hillary ran uh, for president, I share a conversation I had with somebody from our campaign who said, uh, one day we need to have more diversity on the plane. And I said, well, what about me? And they said, well, you don't count. And that was true. I mean, it was hard to hear, but it was true in 2007. You know, Muslims in this country and certainly South Asians, the Arab community was not voting in large enough numbers to make differences in elections. And, um, and the fact that in 2018 and certainly in 2020, those communities made crucial differences in certain states in this country like Michigan and Arizona, I think is just a testament to you can sit, I was raised in, in a very, very large boisterous family. And I remember, I would remember how many times I would go home for the holidays and my uncles or aunts would say, oh, tell Hillary this, or tell the president this, or tell them this. And you know all of this kind of backseat uh, driving, if you will. And now what I like to say to young people is just get in the driver's seat yourself. Instead of telling people to do, just do. And, and people are certainly lots of young um, Muslims um, have been running for office or just trying different professions that they might otherwise be scared of and spending a lot of time on college campuses in the last few months. And young people come up to me and say, well, I'm studying engineering, but I really like journalism. And say, study journalism, try. It's okay to not know and it's okay to try different things. Uh, but my biggest takeaway is do the thing that scares you the most because it, it might be worth it. And I did. <laughs> But you're confident that the political system, you talk about them getting behind the wheel, you are confident that the political system will let them in the car in the first place, will it? Well, it has. I mean, I think if you look at the record number of, uh, of, uh, of women, of diverse candidates that ran in 2018, and then again in 2020, I, 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 think, it's the only way, I think it's the only way forward. So um, I have to be confident. Uh, you are also a passionate advocate, of course, of the greater role of women in U.S. and indeed global political life. Uh, and you relate several inspiring stories, including your own in the book. Uh, uh, but do you get a sense that this process of female empowerment has stalled? When will there be a female U.S. president? I don't 
think the process has stalled. I think we just have to reconcile, you know, I think it's a conscious subconscious. I'm raising a 10 year old son and I am raising my son to respect women, but also not fear their power. And I think so much of it is just these cultural it's subconscious in ways, you know, there are studies that show we find we just, and I don't, I'm not saying men uh, or women, but both and, um, find it hard to see women in executive positions. That's why it's easier for women to run for Congress than it is to run for governor or mayor or certainly president. And that I think is a societal generational. Uh, it's also the way, uh, in my opinion, the, our, our, our country certainly runs our, our, our presidential elections because if we had a, um, a plurality system, then Hillary would have been president in 2016. But it is hard. And it's not just hard in politics. It's hard in business. It's hard uh, across sectors. And it's not uh, specific to the United States. I think this is a, a global, um, a, you know, a global epidemic, if you will. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, again, the only way forward is, is, step, is stepping forward. It's, and I'm cho make, choosing my, my small part. I think about my mother who moved to Saudi Arabia in 1979 with a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a nine-year-old. She didn't speak the language. She didn't know a single person. And she was a sociology teacher teaching women sociology in a language she did not know. And she fell in love with that work so much. She taught herself Arabic. She went back year after year. And the women who have reached out to me, she has helped educate a generation of Saudi women. And I am so proud of the work that she has done as an academic, as an educator, as a leader um, in, in, in that country. Uh, and I think every little, you know, voice and, and in my, in my opinion, she's a very big voice and mind uh, should be honored and lifted up and celebrated. Uh, you mentioned elections there. Uh, let me ask you to look into the crystal ball, if you would. Uh, tell me succinctly, uh, how will the midterms go and who will win in 24? Oh, I have no idea. I think history tells us that uh, this is going to be a rough year for our party, uh, those of us who are Democrats, but that's that's history. And it's a very difficult time. I think the the uh, COVID app, uh, pandemic has has uh, presented all kinds of unanticipated challenges. And uh, I, I think our party has our work cut out for us in November and we have a lot of work to do and we've got to keep enthusiasm, get people out. And uh, it's going to be hard. I have no idea about 2024. I don't have a crystal ball. I'm sorry. Okay. Let me shift to the focus to Saudi Arabia, if I may. Uh, you grew up in the kingdom when it was a very different place in social and cultural terms. Uh, how do you compare the kingdom that you visit now, because you visit regularly, don't you, uh, with all the reforms and the liberalization that's taken place uh, in recent years to the conditions when you were growing up there? I opened the book with a story of getting lost in Balad in the old city in Jeddah. And my mother, you know, uh, still says, you know, she couldn't, couldn't even have imagined I was three and lost and we didn't speak the language and she wouldn't even have known uh, who to call to get help. I, um, you know, one of the best things for me growing up in Jeddah um, was having that sense of community. We call it the Ummah, the ever-present community, those of us who are Muslims. And I cherish that I had those relationships and that experience because I think that that sense of belonging and support gave me this kind of confidence as a young adult moving to United States at a very young age. I share the story of my father getting his kidney transplant. We were living in Jeddah in 1986 and my mother was with us in Saudi Arabia and my father's in New York. And we get this call saying, you know, come to the hospital right now. And my mother has to leave and our Saudi friends call us and call my mother and say, send the children to our house. And my, and we were very young. And I remember my sisters and I jumping up and down saying, we didn't want to go anywhere. We didn't want any more change. And my mother makes an excuse on the phone and says, I don't, you know, we'll leave the kids here because they have their you know, their, their exams are coming up and they have their desks and their bookshelves here. And the very next morning, there's a knock on the door and it's a moving truck. And this man says, I'm here, something about, you know, bookcases and desks, I'm supposed to be moving. And sure enough, we moved in with our Saudi friends. And this feeling that, and it was, that's just the culture, that's the community. You never feel alone, that social obligation. 
And so I always had that, but at the same time, I also knew that when any, whatever restrictions, the moments where I had to cover my hair or, you know, um, not, you know, feeling the kind of the social restrictions that girls had back then, you couldn't wander around the streets back then. I knew that I could just get on a plane. We were traveling so frequently. And so I think I had a unique experience in that whatever freedoms I couldn't enjoy in my current reality was, were just a plane right away. So to go back every year, it's amazing. It's amazing to see what is, is, um, is happening. All of the, the, you know, first of all, you didn't see women in stores. You didn't see the cultural events on the beach. When I was there a couple of years ago with my son, we went for face painting and, uh, on the beach and Ferris wheels and just, just to see, uh, um, also a lot of young Saudi, um, uh, men and women working uh, in small businesses, entrepreneurships, the best coffee shops in the world, best cafes, I would argue, uh, are in Saudi Arabia. I'm biased and the best food. I mean, it's, it's really, I will always have a very tender place uh, in my heart for the, um, you know, the place that was home for me for so long where that I associate with my father. My father's buried there. My father's buried in Mecca. So for me, it's to see the progress is amazing. It's really amazing. Uh, you went to Manarat School in Jeddah, uh, I read, and I also read, interestingly, that you were once an employee of Arab News. <laughs> I was. It was one of my very first jobs. Stories. It was, uh, it was the summer that uh, I, just before I got my White House internship, I'd applied for a White House internship and then left to go home for the summer. And it was a uh, Khalid al Ma'ina, uh, who was then the editor in chief, uh, offered me a position. It was a summer job, but it was like a proper job. I got a, you know, I got a paycheck and everything. And I, um, I edited the style page, which back then was the, was the back of the, uh, the newspaper. And uh, I wrote movie reviews uh, from time to time, but it was a great experience uh, for me. Uh, and, uh, and look, Arab news, it's what we read in our home every single day. It was, it was our New York times. Now that I live in New York, it's New York times, but back then it was, Arab news, and there was a little bit of Saudi Gazette, but uh, it was uh, it was the it was the paper of the day for our family. So I'm so I would have if you had asked me in 1995 if I would be doing an interview uh, like this in 25 years, I would say absolutely no way, no how. But uh, it's a thrill. Uh, going back to the book, uh, it's very much a personal mem memoir, isn't it? Uh, relating some pretty traumatic experiences that you endured, mostly involving your former husband, Anthony Weiner, who was a New York congressman. Uh, you've, you've been very upfront about this, so I feel justified in asking the question. Uh, in the book, you had misgivings about marrying a non-Muslim. What do you think now, with the benefit of hindsight, about interfaith marriage? Look, I think for everybody, it's a personal choice. And for me, having a common uh, cultural faith background was very important. I do write about this in the book. Um, I think any Muslim uh, who's watching will understand uh, in our, in our uh, faith uh, belief, um, men, uh, Muslim men are allowed to marry outside the religion. And it's, a, it's a much more difficult for Muslim women to marry outside the faith. And that really, in the end, had to do, has to do with paternity if there are, if there are children born of that. Uh, marriage, generally, the um, the child takes the father's religion. And so it is, it was a huge uh, uh, crisis of conscience for me. I, I, I had the benefit back then of having a partner who was very interested in learning about my faith and we fasted together and sometimes we prayed together and, you know, he gave up you know, things like uh, pork and alcohol and things that are not allowed in my faith. And I really did feel uh, when I was uh, first with my then husband um, that we were coming together and um, in a way that he honored and respected my faith and we'd have a, um, that sort of common cultural principles and values um, that in which we could raise our child. I, what I think about today, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm not married anymore. I don't know that I would ever be married again. It's not something I think about uh, very often. All I know is I would not have my son. And, uh, and he's the reason I live. And, uh, and that's what keeps me going every single day. Uh, when, when it was all going wrong, of course, it attracted uh, huge media attention, didn't it? Uh, uh, do you think the media treated you fairly then? Or was your uh, privacy 
the price that had to be paid uh, you know, for media who might have been using you as a surrogate uh, for Hillary Clinton or ind indeed for your own success. It was a story, and at least in America, it was a good story. Uh, and that is why I, I, I understood. In fact, when I was considering marrying Anthony, I took that into consideration. I, I knew that you know, he was a rising star in the Democratic Party at the time. He was a member of Congress, as you mentioned. He was widely rumored to be running for mayor of New York City and, and the front runner uh, at the time. And so I did have some misgivings about that, stepping out uh, in, into the public space. And so, of course, I knew it was news. I knew it was news when the story broke because of who he was and because of uh, who I worked for. And I was really just the collateral damage. I recognized that. I share in the book that I was newly pregnant uh, when the story first broke and um, that uh, the New York Times actually reported that I was pregnant. I never actually got the opportunity to tell anybody I was pregnant because it was reported for me. And even in that moment, as it was happening, it was very traumatic and it's a trauma that stays with me today. I recognized that it was news. So I just accepted that reporters were doing what they needed to do. Uh, even the paparazzi <laughs> that would follow me and say, we're, we need, you know, we've got to make money. This has got to make a living as the man who used to follow me around would say, and I understood. It wasn't easy, but I understood. Let me ask you about the future. Uh, you say towards the end of the book uh, that you would do it all again, your, your career in, in US public service. Uh, you, you would do it all again in a heartbeat, you say. Uh, am I to believe from that that you're contemplating some kind of return to US political life? No, but I do want to share for anybody who has ever experienced what it is like to be in public service, that feeling, that moment you walk into that town hall or that gym or that you know, person's living room around the country as you, one does when they're in the midst of a campaign. And I've had the honor of doing many, many times. You are carrying people's hopes, fears, aspirations, and dreams with you when you walk out that door. And so to me, there's nothing like that, that feeling of I can do something to help that one person if my candidate is successful and this mission is successful. Very hard, in my opinion, to find a profession that gives that kind of um, affirmation and sense of purpose. And I think it's one of the reasons why Hillary Clinton and I have been on so many of these adventures together as we call them, because I think every single day we wake up and that is what drives us. And that's I think why she'll be in public service forever as she says but I don't think either of us would do it as candidates anymore. Uh, and certainly, well, I shouldn't speak for her. I would never do it as a candidate. I've, I see, I've seen what it takes. I know what it takes. Um, and so uh, it's not for me, I don't think. Uh, you have deep experience and expertise in the US political system and also deep firsthand knowledge of Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, the Arab world. Couldn't you combine those, perhaps in some kind of ambassadorial role? Would that be something you might be contemplating? Oh, Frank, this is an excellent idea. You know, I this is my year. I've I've, I've stolen from Shonda Rhimes when she wrote her memoir. She said that this was her year of saying yes, and I am definitely in my year of saying yes. I am open to all kinds of opportunities and exploring. Uh, different things, uh, what that is, um, I don't know yet, but ambassador sounds really good. Just have to figure out ambassador to what and for what and how, but uh, I like that, actually. Final question, Ms. Aberdeen, uh, and I'm, I'm going back to, to, to books uh, and literature uh, because that's one of the, the themes that runs throughout uh, your book. Uh, so uh, perhaps a career as a professional writer, is there a novel in you? I've always believed my father thought I would be a writer. When I was 10, he brought me Silas Marner back from the UK, and I didn't understand it. The material was over my head. And I remember going to my dad and saying, I don't understand. If George Eliot was Marianne Evans, why didn't she use her own name? And my father said in the Victorian era, women were not taken seriously as authors. And so she wrote as a man. But don't worry, when you grow up and you write your book, you will use your own name and everyone will take it seriously. And so as somebody who carries you know, that, that message, the greatest power you hold is the power in your pen, I, I do think I would write again. I don't know what and I don't know when, um, but I do think I would. I, I'd love to 
maybe even one of the many reasons I moved to Saudi Arabia was my father uh, studied uh, and produced a journal, which my mother now runs, about the conditions of Muslim minorities around the world and the dire situation that many of them have been in for a long time, including the Rohingyas um, and the Uyghurs uh, in China and Myanmar. And so I, I'd, I do want to explore uh, more writing and, and contributing in that way. And, and uh, I just don't know uh, how yet, but I, I'm excited about it. Huma Aberdeen, thank you very much indeed for appearing on Frankly Speaking. It's been absolutely engrossing. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Frank, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed our conversation.